We now move on to the panel, which will consider the evolving supervisory practices to tackle climate risks. We will be joined on stage shortly by the members of the panel. But before that, we have some opening remarks from Sue Lloyd, Vice Chair of the International Sustainability Standards Board. I'm delighted to be able to present to you at your conference today. And it's really unfortunate I can't be there in person, but still delighted to discuss our important work at the ISSB with you. I'm Sue Lloyd, Vice Chair of the International Sustainability Standards Board, or the ISSB. What I want to do over the next few minutes is to talk a little bit about why we were established. Uh, the um, first two standards that we published, IFRS S1, our general requirement standard, and IFRS S2, our climate risk disclosure uh, standard. And then to talk a little bit about the relevance of our work for the capital markets and for financial markets, with a particular uh, focus on why this should be of interest to you in the insurance sector. But first of all, before I get into all of that, I wanted to thank the IAIS for welcoming the publication of our inaugural standards. And in particular, we welcome your conclusion that the standards will improve the quality and comparability of sustainability and climate related information uh, globally, and that this will further enhance your ability as insurance supervisors to assess the exposure of insurance markets and of insurers to sustainability and climate related risks. Now, while sustainability reporting has been around for quite a while, there are specific circumstances that led to the formation of our board. Firstly, investors need decision useful, consistent, comparable information that enables them to be confident that they understand sustainability related risks and opportunities when they're making their investment decisions. Likewise, financial supervisors such as the IAIS noted your support for the ISSB standards as a way to ensure that you get the information you need to assess the potential sustainability related risks building in the system. And previously, sustainability related information that has been provided has been inconsistent. There was a myriad of different frameworks and it wasn't always prepared in a way that worked for the information needs of capital markets. This added cost and complexity for companies and for the capital markets, which rely on efficient information to function effectively. And as a result, both companies and investors have sought clarity and guidance. And international policy bodies such as yourselves have noted the urgent need to address these shortcomings. The ISSB's role is to deliver a comprehensive global baseline of sustainability related disclosures through the application of our standards. And by consolidating and inheriting the resources of other investor focused initiatives, such as the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board's work and the work of the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures, the ISSB has been able to address the fragmentation of the disclosure requirements and align international support for the concept of a global baseline of sustainability related disclosures. And I'm sure many of you know this landscape well because I know that the IAIS set up a climate risk disclosure work stream. And the focus of this work stream, including ensuring IAS standards adequately cover comp climate related risks, sorry, and considering the need for guidance for supervisors to aid with the ISSB's disclosure requirements is a really helpful complement to the work that we are doing. Since our standards were issued, IOSCO, together with the IAIS and the Basel Committee, representing the global financial security sector regulatory standard setters, have assessed our standards as being suitable for use in global markets around the world, endorsing them for adoption. This is a really important step in sending a strong signal to regulators around the world to the 130 members of IOSCO to call on them to build our standards into regulatory um, reporting frameworks. This historic IOSCO milestone ref is a repeat of one other moment in history when the IOSCO endorsed the International Accounting Standards 20 years ago, which has resulted in many insurance companies applying IFRS accounting standards, including more recently IFRS 17, accounting for insurance contracts. Now turning to IFRS S1 and S2, our inaugural standards. 
an important thing is that they fully incorporate the recommendations of the TCFD. And as such, the Financial Stability Board in early July announced that the work of the TCFD has been completed, with the ISSB standards marking the culmination of the work that the TCFD undertook. And this marks yet another rationalisation of the disclosure landscape. IFRS S2, our climate standard, which is designed to be used with our general requirements standard S1, sets out the requirements for a company to disclose information about physical climate risks, such as those resulting from increased severity of extreme weather events, and transition risks, such as those associated with policy action and changes in technology that can affect how a company can run its business and, its, and the opportunities that it has, such as the products a company has that are expected to do well as a result of climate change. We know that this climate-related information is particularly relevant for insurers. Just a few months ago, as I'm sure you know, the largest Californian insurance companies announced that they would stop issuing any new home insurance packages, as they could not afford in the future the cost of dealing with the extreme weather events, including floods and fires in California. The reality is that markets have been failing to take into account and price these sustainability-related risks and opportunities. And that is why, over the last several years, IOSCO, the Financial Stability Board, the G20, the G7 business leaders looked to the IFRS Foundation and urged the IFRS Foundation to work uh, urgently on this. So the ISSB is doing for sustainability-related financial disclosures what the IASB, the International Accounting Standards Board, did for financial statements, creating an international common language that delivers high-quality information and that people can recognise and trust. Our work is based on a robust, informed due process, answering the market needs for the public good of capital markets around the world. But to achieve the global consistency and comparability that is our vision, it's important that the ISSB standards are actually used and applied on a widespread basis. Regulators, including market, banking and insurance regulators, have a key role to play in ensuring that we do not end up with a fragmented regulatory ecosystem for sustainability disclosures. We will have achieved very little issuing our high quality standards if these are not applied in practice to address the information needs of the market. Now, of course, we are aware that this isn't easy. There are implementation challenges ahead. We all need to become familiar with this new language and it's going to take collective effort and time. So at the foundation, we're focused on capacity building, working with partners from around the world to deliver support and develop educational materials. Upskilling starts with ensuring that all stakeholders have a good understanding of the new standards. And to achieve this, we're in dialogue with jurisdictions to support the adoption of the ISSB standards and with regulators and other standard setting bodies to continue to address climate related risks, as we will be further discussed at the panel I know following my opening remarks. With that, I wish you a good continuation of your conference and I look forward to continuing to work with you all as we work together on supporting the implementation of the ISSB standards around the world. Thank you. Thank you to Sue for providing such a clear steer on the issues that needs to be addressed. We are now joined on stage by the panel, and I am pleased to hand over to Beth. Thank you. Today's panel will focus on the need for climate disclosures and improving transparency and insight into climate risks while avoiding greenwashing. The IAS has been involved in these issues and in wider climate work. The IAS is interested in including stakeholders in this work and has several consultations planned. The first consultation was issued in March and it proposed changes to the introduction of insurance core principles to position climate risk within the global framework for insurance supervision. It also included questions seeking stakeholder feedback on our overall climate-related work, including on governance and risk management and transition planning. And we will incorporate the feedback received into our 2024 work programs. 
Later this month, we'll publish further consultation to provide guidance for supervisors on conducting climate scenario analysis and a paper that considers the risks of greenwashing and market conduct issues related to climate risk. In 2024, we'll issue a third consultation that deals with issues such as valuation and enterprise risk management and disclosures. Together, these consultations will ultimately come together to form an updated application paper on climate risk. On the data side, the IAS will continue to refine the data collection on climate-related risk in the annual global monitoring exercise and also, also explore introducing additional indicators to capture climate-related risks. Early December, we'll publish the outcomes of this year's analysis as part of the upcoming GMAR publication. The IAS has recently started on a process for developing the strategic plan and financial outlook for 25, 2025 to 2029, during which we will consider our future strategic objectives related to climate risks. Now let me turn it over to our esteemed panel. All of their biographies are in the annual conference app, but uh, we have Andreas, and please excuse if I mispronounce, uh, but Andreas Marquette, who's the Chief Risk Officer for Hannibal Re, Hannibal Re, he is, I'm sorry, Hanover Re, he is virtual. Ken Munigan, the Chairman of Milliman. Masuki Nagamura, hope I said that right, uh, Fellow International Initiatives for Tokyo Marine Insurance. And Daniel Wang, who is the chair of the uh, IAIS Climate Steering Group and the executive director of the Insurance Department for the Monetary Authority of Singapore. So going to our first Slido question, we're going to ask you all uh, to respond and, and then have our panelists uh, look at your answers and provide their own input. So the first Slido question, given moves towards greater mandatory disclosure, what do you expect the climate disclosure to look like in five years' time? You have these four answers. I think you can put it in now. We're pretty split, pretty split here. Definitely no, di no difference isn't, isn't coming out. But. <coughs> um, so Daniel, let me go to you first. What are the IAIS's objectives with respect to climate disclosure? Yeah, thanks, Beth, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'm surprised you guys are still here for this. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, th thanks for uh, being here and, and, and listening to us. Um, so I'll just give a update uh, on the climate disclosures work at the IIS and also some, I guess, some perspectives from a Monetary Authority of Singapore perspective. Uh, so in June this year, the CRSG at the IIS, we set up this disclosure work stream uh, to support supervisors and ultimately insurers uh, with two key deliverables. Uh, first, uh, you've already heard from Sue Lloyd from the ISSB. Uh, it's really to uh, review and provide feedback to fine-tune the ISSB S2 disclosures for the insurance sector. So we hope to uh, understand the ISSB S2 and then provide uh, feedback so that the ISSB can in turn uh, review and, and work further on them. Second, to consider whether there are additional insurance-specific matrix uh, that are not covered by S2 but which can be relevant to the insurance industry and to insurance supervisors. Um, so now that I've covered a bit of the what, uh, let me touch on the why. Uh, so why does climate disclosure matter and matters and, and the kind of role that uh, at least I think IIS should play? So climate disclosures matter in five ways uh, in my mind. So firstly, robust disclosure of climate information closes the data gap. And I think that, that's pretty obvious because data is the single biggest challenge uh, in climate risk management work. Number two, climate disclosure supports the transition to net zero and enables insurers to seize your business opportunities.
Um, so as an international standard setting body, the IIS, um, I would say, play a role a bit like a lighthouse. So a lighthouse as, you know, guides the ship by providing a fixed point of reference. So what I'm hoping the CRSG can contribute to this space is to provide guidance for supervisors and ultimately insurers to navigate all these uh, disclosure frameworks, especially the ISSB standards. So for example, the ISSB S2 climate standard requires insurers to disclose finance emissions on the asset side, uh, as well as industry-specific matrix. So I think the CRSG can contribute more to provide a clear reference point uh, on a set of insurance-specific matrix uh, where possible, so, that we, so insurers and supervisors can avoid this situation where we use a myriad of indicators and, and A is not talking to B and B is talking something differently to C. So this lack of comparability will lead to market confusion and frankly will also add to your compliance costs. So some coalescing and, and convergence towards a set of comparable disclosures uh, will be important. And also because I think this convergence will support insurers with operations in multiple jurisdictions, uh, promote greater harmonization of reporting of insurers, especially if you're part of a banking group or you're part of an, or you have a, you have a bank in your insurance group. Uh, you also achieve greater alignment between climate disclosure and financial reporting. So I think there are all these benefits uh, that this convergence can bring. So Masaki, um, and as an integral inaugural member of the Task Force on Climate Related Disclosures, has progress on climate disclosure been faster, slower, uh, or slower than you expected? Well, thank you, Beth, and uh, many thanks to the IAS for uh, inviting me to this very important discussion. Um, so in ret retrospect, back to uh, 2015, it came to me as a surprise that the FSB was planning to set up a task force which would later become TCFD. Uh, hearing that the FSB had given its attention to climate change, I sensed something very significant was cooking. But I have to admit, though, that I couldn't imagine back then that the TCFD recommendations would become a topic so high in the regulatory agenda. In that regard, the level of public attention to the TCFD recommendations has heightened much, heightened much faster than I initially thought. However, that does not necessarily mean that the implement, implementation has been as fast as the task force expected. The task force published its sixth and final status report last month. And with that, the task force uh, met its remit and was disbanded. The, the report concludes that the amount of TCFD-aligned information being reported increased over the past three years. However, the levels of disclosure still fall short of the task force's 11 recommended disclosures. More than anything, the task force is concerned that not enough companies are disclosing decision-useful climate-related financial information. The situation could hinder investors, lenders, and to, to a certain extent, uh, underwriters' efforts to assess and price climate-related risks. As we heard from uh, Ms. Sue Lloyd earlier, we now have the IRFRS S1 and S2 standards, which were <coughs> developed based on the TCFD recommendations. They are hopeful to, to, to be implemented in each jurisdiction over the coming years. I am among those who welcome the de development. What I do hope from the change in the corporate disclosure landscape is that a growing number of stakeholders will find value in disclosing climate-related uh, financial information as a tool to demonstrate an organization's strategy and not as a mere compliance exercise. Unlike mainstream financial reporting, disclosure practices on climate-related issues are far from mature. There are many ongoing discussions to further clarify or refine the approaches and practices. They are continually evolving. And that keeps both preparers and users of climate-related disclosures busy as they constantly need to follow the trends in practices as the landscape changes quickly. 
So that's my observation. All right, thank you very much. So I have this next question is for both Andreas and Ken, but let's go to Andreas, who's uh, remote first. Um, are we seeing a significant global shift to increase disclosure of climate risks? And what challenges are insurers facing in making this journey? Thank you, yes. Uh, first of all, uh, it's great to be here on, on this panel, so thanks for the invitation. Obviously, it would be even greater to be with you, which didn't work for me for logistical reasons. And Beth, thanks uh, for pronouncing my uh, name so correctly. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> very good. So, um, I should probably start that, uh, saying that uh, we are committed to the Paris target. Uh, we are committed as a company to uh, support the transition. And uh, this, this has something to do with our general uh, stance on sustainability, but also with the fact that we as a global reinsurer, uh, we are exposed uh, to climate change risks, especially for, uh, from uh, insurance and natural catastrophes. So this is um, certainly kind of the physical risk side of that one of the major areas where we have to cope uh, with, with that and i'm happy to look at it later in more detail on the on the disclosure um, side i think uh, we, we as we are supporting the target we are supporting the transparency around that and uh, so we, we support these initiatives the main challenges we face at the, at the moment is really which was already addressed by, by Sue and by Daniel, is uh, the fragmentation, so many standard setting, setters working um, on uh, uh, disclosure requirements or recommendations, and they are, they are not always uh, aligned. So uh, it's it's good uh, what, what I hear here from, from uh, the different standard setters that uh, we, we, we want to work on defragmentation uh, here to make it uh, really harmonized and, and, and meaningful, uh, especially also for, for global organizations. That's, that's certainly one of the challenges uh, that we face. Um, then probably we face different challenges as, as companies from say an inside out versus an outside in risk perspective. Uh, I would say um, outside in, uh, so, so this is like our physical uh, risks, for instance, to, to capture them. Um, it, um, it is actually new uh, trend components that, that we need, need to uh, consider, which uh, were not so prominent in our models, for instance, our pricing models, uh, say 10, 10 years ago. And of course, uh, these, uh, Trend detection and adjustments depend on so many uh, variables that lie far uh, in, the, in the future uh, for us, and also on many policy measures. So that's that's a challenge that that, that we are facing. I guess on on the uh, inside out perspectives, so what is our kind of contribution uh, that we definitely want, want to reduce to to climate change? Uh, there, we uh, global organizations are exposed to the, the different speeds. If I really say speed, I'm not sure uh, of of all the different countries of this world in adopting uh, transition plans and taking policy measures. Which also means that, uh, for instance, for a reinsurer, the um, granularity of data we can get. Uh, related to uh, climate change risks in different countries is uh, very diverse uh, at, a, at a moment, depending uh, on uh, the importance of, uh, of the transition plans and uh, the maturity of the decision plans uh, in, in the different countries. So maybe that's first uh, elements to answer your question. Great, thank you. Uh, Ken, can I just say same question? Of course, happy to. So, when we when we think about the challenges, <coughs> excuse me, related to disclosure, the first challenge is fundamentally one of mindset. What mindset do insurers and supervisors take with respect to the disclosure process? One path would be to see the climate crisis 
as an exogenous event where insurers respond with a zero-sum game mindset and focus exclusively on just reducing clearly demonstrable risks. My, my view is that that would be a mistake. An alternate path would be to see that the climate crisis is both crisis and opportunity. I think Daniel's analogy with the White House was an excellent one. Disclosure gives you in, needs to give information about how insurance companies are going to respond to a crisis, but they're doing so because they're also on a journey. The destination is building a sustainable economy where we come up with sustainable ways to meet fundamental human needs, and that's going to be fueled through advances in science and technology. So the challenge of mindset is to take a balanced approach where we, where we look at disclosing risks, ways that we're going to mitigate them, and reduce actions that are incompatible with the sustainable future, and ways that the insurance company is going to respond to play its role in building this new sustainable economy. The second challenge is that we need to consider the full distribution, the full probability distribution of events, particularly including the tail of that distribution. As we disclose information related to climate, we mustn't just simply focus on expected values, but consider that entire tale. In, in my past experience, my expertise uh, was working with insurers and supervisors to disclose information related to market risk, particularly associated with the stock market. And there, insurance companies and their, and their actuaries and risk management professionals carefully look at the entire tale, focusing specifically on the, that entire distribution, focusing specifically on that tail of the distribution, what events could occur that could damage the insurer, and how will their risk mitigation actions respond during that tail event. So the cli climate crisis and climate-related disclosures are no different, and we must apply risk management best practices to that situation. Next, the next challenge is not to simply disclose quantitative information, but also to give sufficient information to supervisors so that they, they can evaluate the resilience of an insurer's strategy in responding to climate change and, and avoid just boilerplate disclosures. You know, if you think about supervisors being able to understand the plans of the insurers, I'd like to quote a famous philosopher, Mike Tyson. He said that everybody's <laughs> got a plan until he gets punched in the face. Well, the climate crisis will be that punch in the face for humanity. The plans of insurers need to be resilient. They need to overcome any unforeseen action uh, and make sure that the insurance companies can, can bob and weave and survive no matter what the climate, the climate throws us. The last challenge is not on the disclosure itself, but the organization making it. Insurance companies need organizational structures that are capable of responding to such a complex event. Very often, organizational structures are designed and optimized for efficiency, not adaptability. Responding to the climate crisis is the ultimate test of adaptability. That requires organizational structures that break down silos and facilitate communication horizontally across the organization. Also, organizations that include expertise that's related to climate, that's interspersed without, throughout the organization, where those people have the, the freedom and professional responsibility to communicate with and collaborate with and, and, and muster all of the resources of the organization to make the required disclosures. Great, thanks so much. I did not anticipate the Mike Tyson quote, but that <laughs> definitely adds something. So let's go to polling question two. Uh, do insurers have sufficiently granular data on physical risks to understand their exposures on both sides of their balance sheet? You only get a yes or no here, so. No, wow, okay. Well, let me ask first, um, so uh, Masaki, let me go to you first. Uh, what additional information and data do insurers need to better assess risk from climate? Yep, uh, thank you, Beth. Um, so let, let me be clear that <clears throat> insurance underwriters do not rely solely on disclosed uh, information. Uh, for underwriters to evaluate risks properly, they typically look for uh, proprietary information. But having said that, 
I have no doubt that enhanced disclosure benefits insurers because frameworks such as TCFD urges company corporates to identify risks and opportunities that involve uh, corporate activities, which in turn creates opportunities for insurers to, to intervene. Um, should I also uh, talk about what additional information? Sure, we're a little over, but here you go. Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, so on what additional information and data are, are needed? Um, the answer may not only apply to insurers, uh, but more broadly to uh, financial institutions. There are actually many types of information that needs enhancement, but I can point out that four topics were highlighted in the, uh, in the TCFD's uh, status report, namely greenhouse gas emissions, uh, physical climate risk, uh, financial impact, and transition plans. Um, do I, do I have the luxury of uh, going further and talk a bit more about greenhouse gas emissions? Is that so okay? So let me, let me jump to Ken just to get everyone in. No. Um, how, did, how do you think this differs? I think our audience pretty clearly doesn't think they have enough information, right? Uh, do you think that differs between physical and transition risk, assets and liabilities? Uh, and do you think there's a role for regulatory reporting? Absolutely, I do. When, when you look at this issue, there's a role for regulatory reporting in many different ways. Before we even get to insurance companies, for, for all publicly traded companies and for uh, municipal entities, subnational entities, and, and so on, investments in risk mitigation and adaptation lead to risk reduction in the future. So there's an important element of reporting that has to take into account the time dimension and it has to be done in a way to actually encourage this. The analogy I'd, li I'd like to use is with, you know, in traditional accounting, investments in building up human capital, you know, tra training people, helping them develop skills, that shows up purely as an expense in current period income statements. It doesn't show up as an asset that will pay off in future periods. I think we need to do a better job with respect to climate-related reporting here, where an investment to mitigate risk today is going to lead to benefits in risk reduction and lower costs in the future. When, when we come to insurance companies, uh, the, the first principle I'd like to call out is interdependence. When an insurance company is reporting relative to its actions, it's, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. All of the other insurance companies are doing the same, and the only way to really understand the risk position of an insurance company with respect to the climate crisis is to understand the actions of all the insurance companies throughout the system, and, and supervisors need to be in a position to do that and to ag aggregate up you know, consistent, accurate information to make the assessment of the system-wide performance. So in particular, I'd like to just give one example on the asset side of the balance sheet. Responding to the climate crisis is going to require humanity to build a sustainable economy that's fueled through innovations in science and technology. Those innovations are going to need to be deployed at a scale that has never been seen before, a truly global scale. And that's going to require the use of debt capital. Equity capital is used to develop the innovations, to get them through the stage one, stage two, stage three process, but to actually scale them at global scale, to deploy them at global scale, is gonna require the use of debt capital. Insurance companies and pension plans are the largest pool of debt capital on the planet. And so as insurance companies participate and fill that role as a primary investor to respond to the climate crisis, and then that information gets reported up the chain, it will be important to then aggregate it all to make an assessment as to how uh, effectively humanity is moving along that chain, to moving along, the, along that trajectory to build a sustainable economy. Thanks so much. Andreas, uh, do you see any possibilities here for public-private cooperation? On the disclosure, you mean uh, probably on the, on the risk mitigation, more so, definitely there, uh, and there, there's uh, 
definitely the, uh, the, the need uh, to do so. If um, we, we look at the, the challenges uh, that, that we faced uh, and, and the data that we have, you, uh, sort of, uh, I uh, was a little bit uh, surprised by the uh, sort of, uh, large portion of, of no, but uh, if we see the full lens landscape, that's probably true. But if we look at the physical risks, I would almost say the data is all around us. We, uh, we, we almost see on a monthly basis weather patterns uh, across across the globe that are, can be attributed in parts to, to climate change. Uh, so this kind of first level level data is there and uh, we, we can also see uh, the trends. So uh, the, uh, uh, the question is how, how do we use that and do we use that efficiently uh, at the moment? In, uh, and in terms of response, um, and what what uh, insurance reinsurers can can certainly do is increase the prices if, if the risk uh, increases, but that's that's not enough. That's um, where uh, uh, insurance will become unaffordable at a at a point point in time. So um, risk awareness uh, is uh, uh, one important thing that we can contribute to, and then. Um, risk mitigation, and I think there uh, is probably the major element of uh, private uh, public partnerships uh, that we should uh, try to source to to make uh, risk mitigation um, happening. Uh, and I'm talking here about flood management. We, uh, uh, Sue mentioned uh, that in her initial statement and uh, wildfire where we see uh, the most mo most prominent impacts of climate change in the last couple of years uh, there is still a lot of lot to do in terms of um, say, creating awareness uh, that these exposures are growing all across the globe almost and that we need to take uh, countermeasures uh, but let me also say i mean uh, we are here trying um, to address the risk, I mean, um, with disclosures and risk management in insurance companies. At, at the end, it, we need to uh, implement the agreed policy measures, say, in, in Paris at, at, the, at the COP uh, 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 meetings, and we need to implement them uh, quicker to uh, reduce the overall risk. So um, we, we can't cope with this risk only by disclosure, by risk management in insurance companies uh, or pub private public partnerships and risk mediation. We, we need to make sure that we avoid the tail end risk uh, that uh, were also, also mentioned by, by uh, Ken, uh, because they are ultimately will, will only lead to the, to the fact that insurance will become very uh, expensive to meet. Great, thank you so much. Daniel, what can supervisors do to support more effective gathering of climate data? Let me start by acknowledging first the data challenge, right? Because both the breadth and the depth of the data that's required. So the analysis of climate-related risks is definitely multifaceted. There are interlinkages between transmission channels, uh, there's increased uncertainty, there are non-linear effects, and then there are feedback loops between physical and transition risks. And then if that's not enough, you have this long-term horizon uh, that is not typical in, in other types of risk management areas and data. So I see three broad areas that uh, supervisors can contribute. So firstly is supervisors can and must develop and implement clear and consistent climate data reporting requirements. Uh, so in doing so, insurers are then nudged to consider systems and processes to enable the collection uh, and reporting of the data. So the goal really must be to achieve comparable data which is relevant and suited clearly to each national jurisdiction. Uh, for example, you need to adjust some matrix to reflect and say an emerging market uh, risk profile or to develop new, ma new matrix to account for a material climate risk that may apply only to certain uh, jurisdictions. And I think in some ways, uh, the IIS, we are trying to pave the way for, for such uh, consistent climate data reporting. So for a start, uh, 
you know, insurance supervisors who are just starting on this journey, you can take reference from the IAIS's uh, annual GME uh, data elements. Uh, insurers can likewise consider whether your systems allow for the collection of such data if, and if not to take steps uh, to, to be able to collect them. As part of macro prudential supervision, supervisors can also collect climate related data through scenario analysis and stress test exercises. So such exercises will prompt insurers to reassess their data needs for climate modeling and risk management. Uh, and certainly over the past year and a half, the IS has provided quite a bit of capacity building to national and our member supervisors uh, in this space. So improving gather gathering of data and disclosures is an iterative process of collection, analysis, and very importantly, refinement. So we should continue to press on. The second area I think is that uh, supervisors can encourage the adoption of a global baseline standard, ISSB standards. Uh, so at the national level, supervisors can make clear uh, national expectations on ISSB aligned climate related disclosures. And to facilitate adoption, uh, we as supervisors can consider a phased approach to provide time for insurers to build up capacity. So this aligns with the IAIS, IAIS's uh, concept of proportionality. And this can be a case where we start by requiring public listed insurers and other companies uh, to do so uh, because they are already subject to extended uh, disclosure requirements. And then before rolling out to uh, financial institutions which are not listed and eventually to small and medium enterprises. So such, such a phase approach can be considered. Ultimately, fostering convergence to a common baseline will provide greater harmonization for insurers, uh, as I already mentioned in my earlier remarks. Finally, I think supervisory efforts should also be reinforced with uh, capacity building efforts. So we can provide training and support to insurers to improve their ability to collect and analyze their climate related data. And very importantly, I think we can lean into the pool of green expertise through industry collaboration. So that's the public-private point that, that Bev and Andres was talking about. For example, uh, we can convene an industry task force with representatives from financial institutions, corporates and non-governmental organizations, as well as industry associations, brainstorm ways around data collection challenges, and then provide guidance and parameters uh, in terms of implementing the disclosures. Uh, beyond supervisors, other agencies such as the Accounting Regulatory Authority can also lend a hand in providing guidance and complying with uh, these reporting requirements. I'll just pause here. Great. So we're on to our third polling question. Uh, what steps are needed to address risks from greenwashing? This is multiple choice, so clear legal regulatory frameworks, better governance, increased staff training, better consumer education, or everything's great, no change needed. Clear like legal, that's us. Oh no. <laughs> so Daniel, <laughs> what steps are being taken at an international level and in Singapore to address the issues of greenwashing? Yeah. So the, there's an increasing number of insurance and pension providers who are now offering products with sustainability features or making net zero commitments. So greenwashing can really erode society's trust in the role played by the financial sector in financing the transition. And frankly, as one of the largest institutional investors, uh, insurers, you are also at the receiving end of greenwashing. Uh, and as underwriters, insurers also face greenwashing risks arising from the declaration of your insurance, and in turn can be exposed to regulatory and litigation risks. So this is a two-way problem. Um, so what is useful is that, uh, as Beth already highlighted, uh, Sometime this month, uh, the upcoming public consultation on climate supervisory guidance will comprise the IIS's views and recommendations on climate-related market conduct issues, uh, including greenwashing. So I invite uh, everyone to have a look. And more important than have a look, please, please respond and give us feedback. Uh, and we work together uh, towards uh, enhancing this set of supervisory guidance. Um, on top of supervisory guidance, I think greenwashing can be addressed through a couple of enablers disclosures, taxonomies, and technology. So firstly, disclosures. I've already made my case for disclosures, so I'll, I'll keep it there. But really, this safeguards against greenwashing by ensuring that insurers uh, can make accurate and truthful claims 
about your green credentials. As discussed earlier, a global baseline standard uh, will really require a coordinated effort. So let's have uh, work towards this credible, consistent and comparable disclosures. At a product level, uh, supervisors can set disclosure requirements on ESG labels. So for example, funds that are sold to retail investors in Singapore under an ESG label must provide relevant information and disclosures to substantiate that label. Mandatory disclosures include information such as the fund's investment, ESG investment strategy, criteria, and matrix used to select the fund's investments. Another area that deserves focus is the ESG rating providers. Uh, supervisors can also reference the IOSCO's ESG ratings and data products providers report. Uh, this recommend best practices for these providers to, explore, to establish uh, industry standards of transparency. Uh, I'll go quickly into taxonomies, which is the second point. So globally interoperable taxonomies are extremely important. So in these taxonomies, specific transition activities are presented with descriptions of technical pathways uh, and emission reduction targets. This helps to reduce the cost of market participants and mitigate risk when facilitating funds to sectors and activities that are making efforts to decarbonize. So a good taxonomy provides clarity on the economic activities that contribute to environmental objectives. Uh, so examples, clearly everyone is very familiar with the EU taxonomy, uh, which is very much the first of its kind and groundbreaking. Within Asia, in Singapore and in, and in my part of the world, we also have the ASEAN taxonomy. Work is underway to, to make these taxonomies interoperable. Uh, in fact, many national and regional taxonomies, first point of reference is the EU taxonomy. So in that sense, I'm, I'm quite confident that uh, in time to come, uh, there will be greater convergence and interoperability. Uh, just a quick point to end off is on technology. Technology can be harnessed to find effective ways to reap the upsides of green financing. Uh, and this in turn helps mitigate greenwashing risks. Uh, for example, the MES, we collaborated with the UN Climate Data Steering Committee's Net Zero Data Public Utility uh, to harmonize ESG data reporting. And so this allows data reported by local entities in Singapore to eventually be piped, piped in and transmitted to the NZEC DPU. So this allows the public to access the such data at no charge. So insurers and stakeholders alike can also mitigate the risk of greenwashing through referencing uh, such databases. So, so I think these are some of the avenues and tools uh, which we can uh, you know, utilize to, to help combat greenwashing. So I want to ask all three of you the same question, but let me start with you, Ken. Uh, what steps can insurers take to address the risks of greenwashing? There, there are several. The, the first has to do with putting a price on carbon. Having a globally agreed carbon pricing system is something that policymakers can do at the, at the highest level. And you might ask, well, what, what does that have to do with insurers and supervisors of insurers? Well, from a supervisory perspective, this hasn't yet happened today, but it may happen in the future. And so assessing the solvency of an insurance company, uh, it would be reasonable to ask insurance companies to produce information related to the performance of the company in the event of a specific carbon price scenario. And so then that information being available uh, would help counteract uh, the potential for greenwashing. The second point would be uh, if insurers required scope one, two, and three carbon emissions from uh, corporate customers in the underwriting process and from the companies in which they're going to invest, then aggregating that information and making it, making it transparent would provide a lot of information to counteract the effects of greenwashing. I think the, the most overarching issue is that insurance companies need to be uh, you know, giving a message to the public, to their customers, that's aligned with the actions that they're taking in managing the business. And there needs to be transparent, readily available information so that people can see that alignment. And uh, you know, they, don't, they don't have to, to guess about it or, or maybe uh, feel that they were, they were misled if, if the inf that information subsequently uh, comes to light. I think, I think another area is, has to do with the whole realm of carbon credits and renewable energy credits. Uh, lots of corporate company, lots of companies are using those uh, to help them on the path to sustainability. But as of now, 
uh, carbon credits and renewable energy credits do not constitute what I would call a transparent, well-functioning market. And if they're going to be relied on and uh, we're not going to see instances of greenwashing, they, they need to become a transparent, well-functioning market. In, in my uh, experience in market risk management, uh, I've worked with many insurance companies to trade futures contracts on the Standard & Poor's 500 index to mitigate the risk that they have associated uh, with the stock market. And that's a transparent, well-functioning market. You can go to the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, trade those contracts, you know exactly how that market functions, you know exactly what this instrument is, it's the, and the information on purchases and sales is available to everyone, and we need to make that the standard that uh, sustainability-related contracts ultimately get to. Thanks. Masaki? Uh, yes. Uh, most importantly, uh, for, for insurers to minimize the risk of uh, being accused of greenwashing, uh, corporate managers should stay accountable for, for the making of, of this strategy. The disclosed information needs to be aligned with the strategy set out by the company. And information that are based on assumptions should be supplemented by prerequisites as well as uh, limitations in making accurate assumptions. And to ensure the credibility of disclosed information, assurance will become more important. In this regard, I think it is worth noting that the, the International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board, IAASB, <laughs> is holding a, a public consultation on its uh, proposed standard for uh, sustainability assurance called uh, the ISSA 5000 until the 1st of the de December. So that's something that uh, may be uh, worth looking at. Now, disclosed information with forward-looking aspects and ambitions such as transition plans may be subject to higher potential of greenwashing allegations. And it has much to do with the credibility of the scenarios or decarbonization pathways adopted by the preparer. The more such scenarios or pathways are supported by the public, the lesser the risk of being accused as washing, I think. It is therefore of great importance that each government set out a clear pathway towards the decarbonization. And transition towards carbon neutrality is such a complex as well as an evolving issue that requires deep understanding of the subject. So collective efforts uh, needs to be in place to inform the public with a proper set of information. Um, if I may draw from the case of uh, Japan, uh, we're, we have created the so-called so TCFD consortium where uh, both sides of the investment equation uh, gets, gets together and discusses about what constitutes uh, decision-useful climate-related uh, dis disclosure. Also, uh, from the perspective of avoiding uh, being accused of uh, greenwashing. So through such uh, collaborative efforts, um, I think both um, you know, the financial institution side as well as the uh, preparer side uh, can learn from, from each other. Great, thank you. Uh, Andreas, let me give you the last word on this. I mean, uh, the main element certainly has, has been mentioned by the other panelists. <coughs> uh, commitments uh, and of public um, disclosures need to match with kind of in internal, company internal measures uh, taken and need to be backed by them. Uh, that's what we have to carefully uh, consider. This said, of course, uh, this is a complex. Um, risk to, to manage for uh, insurers and reinsurers because um, we we are kind of exposed to additional uh, disclosure requirements. We are also exposed to, uh, say, um, NGOs requiring uh, stronger commitments um, in, uh, in some areas. So um, with, with all of, of that, that push, a, a push for more disclosure also uh, creates a push for uh, backing this with uh, 
good uh, measures internally where you can um, evidence uh, that that you are um, aligned to, to the commitments uh, you you are taking, and uh, of course here um, there is a role to play for the disclosure requirements to be uh, maybe not overly complex in a sense that uh, it's getting harder and harder to evidence that uh, these uh, disclosures are. Uh, are really at the, at the core of the company and are backed by good uh, data. And uh, also, again, um, a case for interoperability and uh, sort of defragmentation of, of requirements that we don't get uh, contradicting uh, requirements uh, that, that we have to report uh, on, which then also certainly increase uh, the, the, the risk of being exposed to greenwashing. All of that, uh, of course, I mean, um, at, at the flip side, if we make um, have good taxonomies, which are audible, uh, which are very detailed, that, of course, uh, increases also the cost of, of implementation uh, of that. And many uh, insurers and uh, reinsurers in Europe are running uh, large scale uh, projects at the moment to make all of these uh, disclosures happening, which uh, in the end, of course, also increases the cost uh, of, of insurance uh, for, for policyholders. So there needs to be a balance uh, to uh, uh, for, for both sides, uh, complexity, uh, audibility, uh, so to avoid greenwashing on the other hand, to uh, maintain the costs of, of disclosure. Great, thanks so much. Uh, we have, we were going to take questions, but we literally have two minutes left. So I think we'll push everything off. If, uh, oh, we have one question. Is there a microphone? Yes, over here, he's coming, right here. I'm Ryusuke Ushida from Tokyo Marine. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this uh, very insightful discussion. Uh, I have a question about uh, decision use for uh, information in climate-related uh, disclosure. Uh, one of the biggest challenge uh, uh, it's, uh, in climate disclosure is data availability or quality, uh, especially uh, scope three of uh, GHG emission. Uh, I think uh, it's important for us to try our best to uh, disclose our scope 3 data, uh, but I'm not sure if it would be division, uh, decision useful uh, for investors because the quality of uh, scope 3 data is not necessarily good uh, and therefore can be misleading in some cases. As Masaki said, assurance uh, audit can be a solution, but if auditors uh, find the data quality is not good, what should we do? Uh, can you provide uh, your thoughts on this dilemma, please? So Masaki, he mentioned you. Does that mean you answer? <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Yusuke san for, for that very important question. Um, that is right. Uh, at this moment, uh, uh, scope three emissions are very rough, <laughs> very premature. In, in a premature stage uh, to disclose. But um, at TCFD, all members were aware of, this, of the situation. Um, knowingly, the limitations of the quality of our scope three, they still uh, pushed for the disclosure. The, re the reason why is that um, because scope three, because of the importance of uh, scope three, it's, uh, it's closely related to the Discuss, uh, the discussion on hitting net zero by 2050. And if the world is re really serious to, to achieve that, all actors really need to bring their emissions down to zero by 2050. It's all that simple. So um, if we wait until the data becomes uh, you know, more reliable or credible, Nothing, nothing's going to happen. That, that's what we thought. So uh, although in, in the, the early days, um, we're, the intention is not to really um, 
press for accuracy, but it's rather to enhance more disclosure. If the insurance companies and financial institutions, those who are in the um, upper side of the investment chain, become really serious and start asking to its uh, customers and investees to disclose more about their emissions, then over as the years goes, maybe it may take uh, three or five years, but from now, you'll see more uh, credible information in the market. So unless you start now, nothing's going to happen. So I think th the idea is that. Perfect. Right. And just add on yeah, to what Masaki is saying. Just very short. Uh, firstly, ISSB, right? Because if there's national implementation of ISSB, we have something to talk to about, compare with, uh, and everyone has already, in a way, agreed. So national implementation uh, probably needs to follow very soon. And to paraphrase uh, what uh, Masaki is saying, please do not let perfection be the enemy of the good. <laughs> Just do it, and then we'll all get there. Great. Thanks so much, Daniel. Well, with this quality of a panel, we could go on for another hour, but of course, we don't have that time. So I'd like to ask you all to thank our great panel members, and uh, thank you all for attending. <laughs>